uh, we will be talking about non-contact temperature sensors. The procedure is that uh, we uh, want to measure the temperature of objects that uh, have uh, temperature above uh, the uh, temperature that we can actually measure and uh, uh, with a contact thermometer uh, we are able to do this uh, with uh, temperatures up to 2000 centigrade, 1700, uh, especially with thermocouples. Uh, with non-contact temperature sensors uh, we have the possibility to measure even higher temperatures and uh, the way it works is that uh, we measure the emitted radiation of an object. Any object that has a temperature above absolute zero will have uh, some emitted radiation. This emitted radiation is a function of uh, the object's temperature. Uh, we'll see the equations in a minute on some of the next slides. So we are we want to measure only this emitted radiation uh, with uh, the sensor. Uh, unfortunately, there are other components, uh, and those components are being picked up by the sensor as well. Uh, one of the components is uh, ambient radiation. Uh, around your object you may have other sources of uh, radiation and uh, the radiation might go directly to the sensor so from your heat source into the object and uh, it might go also uh, from the heat source to your object and then it will be reflected so uh, a very important component uh, will be reflected radiation uh, when it's being reflected from the object or uh, the ambient radiation when it is going to the object directly. Uh, then uh, we might have some absorption in the atmosphere which is shown here in the middle of the screen and uh, this comes in play especially when uh, we have uh, uh, some larger distances or uh, when the atmosphere uh, absorbs the infrared radiation on the wavelength that we are using. Uh, we will be using uh, IR spectrum, so infrared radiation, and uh, especially water vapors um, might cause us problems on certain wavelengths. We'll see that again later in some charts. And the last component uh, might be the transmitted radiation. Uh, imagine that uh, your object is transparent in the IR band width and uh, you have uh, some heat source behind it. So this heat source behind the object uh, will emit some radiation. Uh, this radiation will go to your object and uh, then it will go through at least partially and uh, you will see it in your sensor. So uh, if uh, your object is transparent to the IR uh, then uh, this might be an issue as well. Uh, let's take a look first at the emitted radiation. Uh, the emitted radiation is uh, given by Planck's law and uh, the Planck's law is basically telling us uh, what is the intensity of the radiation as a function of temperature and uh, wavelength. So here in this equation here this i is the basically the intensity of the radiation uh, t is uh, the temperature and uh, then here we have the frequency uh, of, uh, the, of the of the signal that's uh, the electromagnetic signal that is being emitted from the object uh, if you plot that in a chart for different temperatures uh, as uh, per wavelength uh, you might see this uh, typical structure here uh, where uh, we have different temperatures and different intensities. So for example, if uh, the temperature of the object is uh, 3500 Kelvin, then uh, you can see that uh, it emits rather low energy. Uh, but uh, as we are increasing the temperature, then the energy that's being emitted from the object increases with um, it very quickly. Uh, there is a very quick increase of uh, the energy. 
so uh, when we are talking about the visible spectrum then uh, we are somewhere between let's say 350 to maybe 750 nanometers so we are somewhere around this range so this is the visible range so here we can actually see the colors but uh, you can see that there is a significant amount of energy in uh, the IR band and uh, only when the temperature is high enough uh, we can see with uh, we can see the radiation with our own eyes but uh, when uh, we have uh, lower temperatures then the peak of this energy is in the IR spectrum so uh, there are basically two ways how we can measure the temperature with a non-contact sensor uh, one is that uh, we will have a device that will calculate the total energy uh, that is being received so in other words uh, we will be looking for the area under this curve and uh, the area under this curve will be a measure of temperature so uh, we are calculating an integral over uh, the whole band weight or uh, some selected band widths uh, this will be called a total radiation pyrometer. We'll see a few examples today. Uh, the other possibility is uh, that uh, we measure on a specific wavelength. In this picture, uh, it's shown on 650 nanometers. And uh, you can see in this chart that uh, the intensity that we receive on a single wavelength is uh, also proportional to the temperature. So. Uh, as uh, the temperature is increasing, uh, we get higher and higher intensities. So the second way how we can measure the temperature uh, will be to get a single intensity on a single wavelength. And uh, this will be used in devices that are called monochromatic pyrometers. Uh, the reason why we typically use 650 nanometers is simple. Uh, this. Uh, wavelength corresponds to red color and uh, that's where our eyes are sensitive the most so here uh, those monochromatic pyrometers are typically devices where you look directly into the device into uh, some optics and uh, you judge with your own eyes what is the intensity uh, on the red color so we'll see both ways uh, how this is done uh, another important thing is, or interesting thing is, uh, how much energy is actually being uh, transmitted if uh, we look on different band widths. This is shown in the picture here on the right. Uh, on the x-axis we have wavelength and uh, here uh, we have uh, basically intensities or how much energy is being transmitted. So, uh, if, for example, we have an object that has a temperature of uh, 0 centigrade, that's, uh, that's here, then 90% of total power is being emitted between, um, let's say, 7 micrometers and something like 40, 45 micrometers. Uh, if we are increasing the temperature of the object, then uh, obviously the peak is shifting that's uh, visible here in the, in the chart this is uh, called Wien's uh, law and uh, as we are increasing the temperature more and more uh, it gets closer to the visible spectrum anyway if we are talking about uh, say normal temperatures around 0 or 100 centigrade you can know that uh, more than 90 percent of the energy are in the infrared wavelengths so we will not be able to measure them with um, our own eyes or with just monochromatic pyrometers uh, but we will have to use a device that's able to work with those wavelengths so uh, therefore we'll need to use different materials for the optics we'll need to use different uh, sensors uh, that uh, can pick up those wavelengths so uh, now let me talk about uh, the emitted radiation. Uh, we will use a lot the term black body. Uh, the black body is uh, an ideal object because that does not exist in, re in reality, but we can get uh, fairly close to it. 
and an ideal black body is an object that absorbs and receives all the radiation. So in other words, it's uh, an object that uh, receives some radiation and that's able to transmit the maximum amount of radiation. So an ideal black body received so some radiation and then uh, it will transmit all of it. So the proportion between the transmitted and uh, received radiation is uh, 1. So uh, this will be defined with the help of uh, emissivity. Let me just uh, switch to this slide. And emissivity will be a ratio between uh, the radiation from uh, the real object and uh, the black body object. So the emissivity of an ideal black body is 1 because it uh, transmits all the energy that it has received. Uh, all other objects uh, will be less ideal and uh, you can see few examples of emissivities here uh, in the table. Uh, you can see that uh, the emissivity will vary a lot. It is a function of um, material, it is a function of um, surface, it is a function of temperature as well. We'll see all those dependencies later. And uh, usually it's uh, quite complicated to get uh, the emissivity right. So uh, there are tables that might help you uh, where the emissivity is approximately. But uh, usually the safest way how to determine emissivity is uh, to use a procedure that, that I will show you uh, and uh, it will help you to determine the uh, real emissivity of your surface uh, with uh, the, your temperatures. Uh, we can see that, uh, for example, graphite or coal are pretty close to the ideal black body. Uh, fortunately, many objects that we have around us every day have uh, emissivity that uh, is around 0 0.95. So for this reason, uh, we will see that uh, some of the IR temperatures, temperature sensors or thermometers uh, will have a fixed emissivity to 0 0.95. Uh, here you can have, uh, you can have uh, a look uh, on uh, some links uh, on the video that explains actually uh, all this. I uh, will not run it right now, but uh, I recommend you to take a look on that and uh, gain more info about it. So uh, know that uh, emissivity uh, will be very important uh, when we are dealing with IR thermometers and IR thermocameras. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the emissivity or the black body object uh, is an ideal object and in, in reality we don't have it. So uh, if you look here on this chart, the curve, uh, then now, what we see, this is uh, what would correspond to a real, uh, to an ideal uh, black body object. And uh, in nature, we will not find such objects. Uh, an example is shown in this picture, uh, where we have uh, the solar radiation. And uh, we can see that uh, it does not correspond to the ideal black body, uh, because for many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, we have absorption. Uh, we will have absorption in the atmosphere and you can see that in the chart. Here uh, with the yellow area uh, that's uh, what we can receive from the Sun at the top of the atmosphere. So when uh, we have no absorption in the atmosphere and uh, with the red area we have uh, data that are uh, received at the sea level. So uh, the difference is uh, what is being absorbed in the atmosphere. So we can see here that uh, there are several absorption bands. So for example here we have uh, a band where water vapors will absorb a lot, um, all of the incoming radiation. Uh, the same here and uh, we can see other elements as well. For example, carbon dioxide, we can see ozone here that absorbs the UV radiation and so on. So uh, we can know that there will be an influence of uh, the atmosphere 
uh, if we have lo large distances or uh, if uh, the atmosphere has uh, many um, more elements than, than usually such as water vapors or carbon dioxide and so on. Uh, we can also see that uh, the uh, solar radiation above the atmosphere uh, corresponds almost to the black body object which has a temperature of 5250 centigrades. That's actually the, the peak uh, where we see uh, here uh, the, the visible light. Uh, but uh, even so, uh, it's not entirely ideal. For example, here we have an area where uh, it does not correspond entirely to this simplified black body model, where we receive less energy. And then in the visible uh, spectrum, we actually receive more energy uh, that uh, would correspond to the simple model of the black body object. So the black body object is an ideal model. Uh, we'll, we'll try to use it, but uh, we have to know that uh, it applies only uh, with certain conditions. Uh, moreover, the black body object applies only to the uh, objects that are significantly larger than uh, the wavelength. So if uh, we are talking about some small particles uh, as uh, dust, for example, then uh, those small particles will influence a lot the EM field around the particle and uh, the mm, particle will appear as uh, with a very high emissivity. Uh, on this screen you can see a picture that's actually from the book that's referenced below and uh, you can see the, the explanation so here this circle that's a small particle and uh, those lines or those curves are uh, the EM field around this particle so we have some incoming radiation that's uh, being absorbed by this particle and uh, it seems like the particle has a much bigger emissivity. Uh, typically the emissivity of very small particles might be something like 5 or, or 10 or 15. And uh, But the, the, the reason for this large number is uh, only because uh, this does not maintain the conditions under which the term emissivity was uh, defined. So uh, the black body object and the emissivity is uh, according to Planck's law defined only for objects that are significantly larger than the wavelength itself. So they can know that uh, for small particles it's uh, much harder to measure uh, the non-contact temperature uh, because of this uh, emissivity problem. We simply cannot know what the emissivity is or uh, it's uh, very difficult to measure the real value. Uh, so, uh, let's take a look um, on uh, how the emissivity depends on uh, material and on different wavelengths. Uh, the emissivity is uh, not constant and uh, it is uh, changing with wavelength and it is changing also with the material. As we see here on the screen, uh, typically what happens for metallic materials that are shown here in blue, so this, this, this curve. Uh, typically they have a, a large emissivity uh, for smaller wavelengths, so here uh, the, the visible uh, spectrum is somewhere around here, uh, it's below 800 nanometers, and uh, then when the wavelength is increasing, then uh, we have a very low value of emissivity. Now, uh, the result is that uh, we typically find it very hard to measure the temperature of metallic objects uh, directly with an IR thermometer if we do not uh, do some special surface treatment as we'll see, we'll see later. Uh, the typical IR thermometers are used in wavelength uh, somewhere around uh, 7 to 14 micrometers. So uh, we are somewhere here between 7 and let's say 14 micrometers and uh, here we have a small uh, emissivity. It is called spectral emissivity 
because uh, it is a function of the wavelength and um, now if we measure in a certain band width uh, we might have uh, an almost constant emissivity uh, or it may vary really this is a function of material uh, on the other hand, non-metallic materials uh, typically behave in such a way that uh, the emissivity is uh, similar to the metals, at least for dark non-metallic materials. And uh, then as we are increasing the wavelength, then uh, the emissivity is increasing and uh, it's getting bigger. So typically, many materials uh, have emissivity that's in the order of 0 0.95 or 0 0.96 and uh, again if we are using an IR thermometer uh, we measure in the band weight between 7 and 14 micrometers so we are somewhere in this region uh, for light non-metallic materials uh, there is an increase as well but uh, Initially, the emissivity is smaller. Here we are in the visible spectrum, so uh, here we have um, so a different color. Um, but uh, in the wavelength that we actually use for the uh, measurement in IR, so 7 to 14, we have an almost constant uh, emissivity. So it's uh, easier to measure those materials because we have large emissivities and uh, hence uh, we have uh, less problem with reflections or with transmission of uh, radiation from objects behind what we actually measure. Uh, there is also a dependence uh, between the error that you make in the measurements and between the incidence angle. So this is uh, an explanation uh, how you should uh, measure uh, with an IR thermometer uh, so uh, your thermometer should be oriented uh, with an angle of 90 degrees to the surface of your material and uh, if you are getting farther and farther from uh, this 90 degrees then uh, your relative error is increasing here is an example uh, of measurement with a thermal, thermal camera uh, as uh, here on the x-axis we have the angle uh, the zero here corresponds to 90 degrees uh, from the surface of the object and here we have a relative error. So as we are increasing the angle, uh, you can see that up until let's say 55 degrees or maybe 53 degrees, uh, we uh, have a relatively small error, about 2%, which is a, a normal error for thermometers and IR cameras. And uh, then uh, the error is uh, rapidly increasing. So if we are, for example, at 80 degrees from the normal, then we will have an error of about 14%. So it's important to orient also uh, the uh, thermometer or the thermal camera uh, properly when doing those measurements. Now in this chart, you can see that uh, there is a function of temperature as well. If uh, we have smaller temperature, then uh, the angle is uh, smaller. Uh, if we have larger temperature, uh, then the angle is a little bit larger. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, for larger temperatures, we have uh, more radiation that's actually available uh, because it's more radiating, radiating from the object. And uh, therefore, we will be, still be able to pick it up uh, even with larger angles. So this uh, is basically all about uh, the emissivities. Uh, one last note is uh, about the dependence of emissivity on temperature. Uh, on this slide, uh, you have an example uh, of uh, silicon carbide material and its emissivity as a function of temperature and wavelength. So if, for example, uh, we uh, measure this uh, material with wave temperatures between 1000 and 2000 Kelvin then uh, if we do this measurement on a 12 micrometer wavelength then we can see that uh, this is fairly flat and uh, we have a constant emissivity almost 
Uh, on the other hand, if uh, we use a different wavelength, so if we would use um, different materials for the optics or if we would use a different thermal camera or different IR thermometer, uh, then uh, for example 18 micrometers, uh, th there is a significant change in uh, emissivity. Initially it's somewhere like 0 0.95, but as the temperature is increasing it drops to almost 0 0.75 and then it is increasing again. So if we choose this wavelength for the measurements we first need to know about this dependence and uh, how is this looking like. Uh, the same for 20 micrometers. In 20 micrometers again there is a drop um, of emissivity. It's not as significant but it is still uh, quite large. So uh, for this reason uh, when you do IR measurements the, it's one of the most important thing is uh, to know what is the emissivity. Okay, uh, here is an example uh, about the influence of the emissivity on uh, the IR measurements. Uh, the picture on top uh, right is uh, the visible spectrum. So this is a photograph. It is a heat, heated plate and uh, it's a normal sheet of metal and uh, it's been heated from some heat sources uh, that are installed on the back side. And uh, you can see that the surface has uh, different colors. Uh, those colors have different emissivities and uh, therefore in the IR spectrum we will see a distorted image. Now the distorted image uh, is shown here in top left. Uh, you can see in this spot there is a hot spot and uh, we have a heat source that uh, is installed at the heated plate and uh, the heat is spreading out and we can see uh, what are the actual temperatures. Now in the picture of an IR thermal camera you can see here that uh, we have the setting for emissivity so now uh, it was set to 0 0.95 and uh, the temperature um, that we see here 26.3 centigrade uh, is, would be correct only if uh, the surface emissivity is uh, actually 0 0.95. Uh, we can see that the heat is spreading out evenly, but uh, at this edge there is a sharp decrease of temperature and uh, this edge uh, corresponds uh, to, this, to the edge here uh, that we see the transition between the different colors. So uh, here we don't have a change of temperature, but uh, we have a change of emissivity. Uh, so uh, if you have a surface that has a different emissivity and you want to measure temperature, now uh, this is very complicated and uh, uh, you can only measure the correct temperature at places where you know what the emissivity is. Uh, note that here there is a, another band uh, that looks like it's much colder, so it looks like it's about 24 centigrade. And again, it's not possible that the surface changes uh, the temperature so quickly. So there is this sharp edge and then this area that looks colder. Now the reason for this is again difference in emissivity. Uh, we can see here that uh, on the plate there is a silver band and this silver band is actually an aluminium tape uh, which has a completely different emissivity. So uh, if the other surfaces have emissivity of uh, let's say 0 0.95 approximately then this aluminium band will have something like 0 0.1 and uh, for this reason it looks like it's much colder but uh, it's actually not colder it has the same temperature. So you will do this experiment in the labs and uh, the goal will be to obtain a similar picture as you see here on screen and uh, also to use a contact thermometer to find out the emissivity. Now a similar example is uh, shown uh, in this bottom picture. Uh, now this is a heatsink uh, 
and uh, it's an aluminum heatsink and uh, it's being heated by a resistor. Now the resistor is placed from the bottom side and it's heating the heatsink up to say 50 centigrade. Uh, now you can see that we have two halves of the heatsink. The one on the left looks uh, to have a temperature of around 50 centigrade and the one on the right looks uh, to have a much smaller temperature. Um, again, in fact, this is a problem of emissivity. Uh, this heat sink is uh, covered with a special paint uh, only on the left side. And only on this left side, we have a defined emissivity of 0 0.95. So only in this area, uh, we are able to measure the actual temperature. And uh, the area on the right is the original heat sink, uh, the, directly the aluminium. And uh, here we have a much smaller emissivity. Uh, we can see uh, also uh, those uh, circles that are here on the heat sink on the left and on the right, and uh, here on the heated plate as well. Now, those circles are special stickers used in IR measurements, and those stickers have a defined emissivity. So, if uh, we place the sticker on the surface, then at this area uh, we can measure the temperature because at this area we have a defined emissivity. Uh, on the example with the heat sink, uh, you can also see reflection. So here, uh, this area, this is a reflection uh, from uh, the sticker. So this is uh, aluminium and here we see the reflection. So one of the problems we will have with metals is uh, that uh, they will have many reflections. Uh, those reflections will come from uh, the heat sources around it and uh, we need to avoid those reflections. So typically the procedure is that you go uh, around the object with the thermal camera. Uh, you see if uh, the heat sources that you see on the objects are moving or not. And if it's moving, it's uh, the reflection. If it's not moving, it's really there on the object. So again, we will try this uh, experiment uh, in the lab. We'll have this heat sink and uh, you will be able to measure uh, the actual temperature and uh, get uh, this uh, picture with a thermal camera as well. Uh, here is a very similar example. Uh, again, it's a heated plate. Uh, this time uh, it's not heated uh, with a heat source that's behind it, but uh, it's uh, heated with a heat source that's in front of it. And uh, we are looking for reflections from the object. Now, the picture on the left is uh, the normal photograph. So uh, we can see that uh, we have different colors, different colored areas on the heated plate. And uh, the picture on the right is uh, the IR picture. And uh, the plate is being heated to a constant temperature. So all the surface should have the same temperature. But it looks like that there are areas where we have lower temperatures, uh, those shown in blue, and uh, to areas where we have higher temperatures, those shown in red. So there is a very large dependence on the surface. Uh, again, you see this in the lab. Uh, you can note here that uh, the areas that are covered with paint uh, have uh, larger temperature. Uh, they, they actually don't have larger temperature, but they have large emissivity. And uh, if this emissivity corresponds to uh, the settings as we have here, 0 0.95, then only in those areas we are able to uh, get the reading correctly. Uh, the other areas that we see here uh, are not covered with the paint. So this is the normal metal uh, with small emissivity and uh, therefore we have uh, lower temperature reading. Uh, of course, if uh, we would know a map of emissivity of my object, then it's possible uh, to get the correct temperature readings. So uh, 
today some very advanced cameras uh, they allow you to define emissivities for areas or for, for points uh, in the picture so uh, you're not limited at the single setting but uh, using a computer software you may actually define a matrix uh, of uh, emissivities and then you get uh, this picture right but uh, normal cameras like they don't have this function they allow you to set only the emissivity of uh, the whole uh, picture the whole measurement uh, in this picture we can see uh, what we can do with uh, the emissivity problem now if we want to change the emissivity of an object uh, we may use uh, the stickers the stickers are shown here so it like, looks like a normal paper sticker but uh, uh, it has a defined emissivity now typically this emissivity is uh, 0 0.95 or 0 0.96 and uh, you glue this sticker on the object and then on this sticker you have a defined temperature and uh, emissivity and you may read the temperature uh, this sticker works up to approximately 150 centigrade so it's for normal temperatures it's uh, fine to use the sticker now for larger temperatures uh, you may use the, the paint that uh, is shown here in the left now it's a spray and uh, you spray it on uh, the surface and uh, it gives you again a defined emissivity so we can read the correct temperature um, well the, the color that you see here on screen is black but uh, it's, it's also available in white and uh, this has a defined emissivity of uh, 0 0.95 or 0 0.96 again uh, this paint is usually good up to 800 centigrade so up to those temperatures you may uh, use it and uh, then you see uh, some usable results with an IR thermal camera now an example uh, where this was used is shown here in the pictures in the bottom and now this was a piping system uh, where we needed to measure uh, the temperature of the pipe at certain positions uh, now those pipes were made from copper so very low emissivity and uh, here you can see the bright spots uh, here 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 and here and those bright spots uh, are the areas where we have applied the paint and on those areas uh, we actually measure the temperature uh, the other areas as you see here the the background or the pipes here that are not visible that much but those pipes here uh, they did not have this uh, cover and uh, we could not measure the temperature uh, but that was not the goal the goal was only to measure the temperature of the pipe so if you have such a system you may apply the paint on uh, the surface and uh, this will give you a defined emissivity uh, again you will see examples of this in the labs uh, will work with the heat sink and will work with the heated plate where this color is applied uh, so now a few words about absorption uh, we've seen uh, on the very beginning of the presentation that uh, there is some bandwidth uh, that uh, are not actually usable for those measurements and the reason is absorption in atmosphere uh, you can see it here it's uh, actually uh, combining different sources uh, from of data uh, on the top chart we can see absorption as a, a function of wavelength uh, and uh, this is the absorption in atmosphere so uh, the, uh, the larger the absorption the larger the amount of energy that's being absorbed and uh, we can see that uh, there will be several so-called windows uh, where we can actually use IR measurements uh, for temperature uh, you can see that he uh, for example here in this region uh, there is a large absorption ratio it's um, absorbing everything so in this wavelength we will not uh, be able to do the measurements uh, 
most of the IR thermometers for smaller or lower temperatures, uh, they work in this uh, window here. The long wave IR window is between 8 and 14 micrometers. And the reason is that here we have uh, relatively low absorption uh, with uh, exception of this peak and here of this peak at the end. Uh, but uh, the other areas uh, they are quite flat and the absorption is very low. So most IR thermometers and IR cameras work in this long wave IR band. Uh, I'm saying most of IR thermometers because uh, this is a window uh, where you can use uh, the IR thermometer to measure with relatively low temperature objects. So if we are talking something about, let's say, 300, 400 centigrades, then uh, it will radiate at this wavelength and uh, we will use those wavelengths to measure. As uh, our temperatures of the objects will get uh, larger and larger, uh, we will have uh, the emitted radiation and on shorter wavelengths. So uh, then we can move to the middle wave infrared bandwidth here between 3 and uh, 5 micrometers. Uh, if uh, we are talking uh, about very high temperatures then uh, we will use the short wave infrared bandwidth between uh, 700 nanometers and uh, 2.5 micrometers. Now uh, the example where this uh, short wave length uh, IR window is used is uh, for example measurements during welding. So uh, if you want to measure the temperature during welding, uh, the temperature is very high. It's a few thousand centigrades, 2000, 3000, 4000 centigrades. And uh, then uh, the object is radiating on those short wavelengths and uh, we will pick it up here and uh, we have a maximum amount of energy that's uh, available here. Uh, another example is uh, gas, uh, sorry, not gas, but glass production, uh, where we have uh, also very high temperatures. And uh, e even here, we can use uh, those uh, short wavelength infrared cameras to get the measurements. So, based on the temperature range that you require, uh, you need to select the corresponding bandwidth of your camera. So if your application requires you to measure from 0 to 100 centigrades, then uh, use this long wave window. If uh, you require to measure melted molten glass or molten metals, uh, then you will go for this short uh, wavelength infrared windows. Uh, on the bottom chart, we see uh, a similar picture. Uh, but uh, this is only uh, taking account uh, water vapors. So if we have water vapors, then we see that there is a large peak of absorption here in this region that corresponds to the top chart here. In this region, there is absorption of water vapors plus other elements. Uh, here, there is a large peak uh, of absorption as well between the short wavelengths and middle wavelengths. So therefore it's not a continuous band, but two bands that are separated by H2O absorption. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, water vapors uh, in uh, the atmosphere, then it might cause you trouble uh, in the measurements. Now, uh, in this slide, uh, we can see uh, the other elements as well. So uh, the, the top chart is uh, the sum of uh, all the absorptions uh, plus scattering for larger uh, wavelengths. Uh, so again, we might see here the absorption bandwidth. Uh, we can see that water vapor has the largest influence of uh, all the elements that are actually in the atmosphere. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, has a large influence as well. Uh, so especially on those wavelengths uh, here, uh, it absorbs a lot. And on the other hand, oxygen and ozone uh, absorb in uh, the UV band. So uh, there is a, all the radiation is 
UV is absorbed in the atmosphere. Well, not all, but uh, most of it uh, in the ozone layer. Uh, and uh, we can see also scattering here uh, for small wavelengths. Uh, we have Rayleigh scattering and uh, we can again not measure for small wavelengths. Okay, so that's uh, absorption. Uh, here uh, there is an example of absorption. Now this is me uh, with a, taking with a thermal camera and uh, I'm in front of me I'm holding a piece of plexiglass. So uh, some materials are transparent in the visible spectrum so we can see through it like glass, plexiglass, some plastic materials but uh, they are not transparent in the IR band so uh, here uh, the glass is blocking and the IR, the IR radiation and uh, you can see only the part of my face and then this part is the plexiglass uh, that uh, is, is blocking the radiation so not all materials that are transparent to us are transparent to IR cameras uh, now let's have a few words about the detectors uh, there are various detectors that are used uh, for IR thermometers and IR thermal cameras and they all work in uh, different uh, wavelengths so again uh, as a function of uh, what temperature range you require the thermometer or thermal camera uh, will have a different sensor now this is not the task for you to select the sensor uh, but you need to select the range and accuracy and based on that uh, the manufacturer will do the selection and the, the thermometer will uh, either be less expensive or very expensive on the other hand uh, in this chart we can see several examples now uh, we can see that uh, the measurement can be done also uh, with uh, a normal temperature sensor like uh, thermistor that we see here or a thermocouple and uh, that the ability to detect the radiation uh, as a function of wavelength is uh, constant for those uh, sensors so here uh, we see a line that's describing how well uh, this sensor can detect the radiation uh, note that here on the y-axis uh, we have a logarithmic scale so uh, it's not linear and uh, the other sensors that are here on top will have significantly larger ability to detect uh, the radiation. Now here it's uh, called detectivity and it's the ability to uh, detect uh, the radiation of the sensor. Uh, we can see that many materials are actually used uh, for IR detectors, uh, especially uh, uh, materials like uh, germanium, uh, indium, arsenide, uh, silicon, and uh, so here an alloys. Uh, you can see here the the number in the bracket is the temperature of the detector. So we can see that uh, there is also a significant dependence uh, between the material, its uh, detectivity, and uh, its temperature. So for example here for germanium uh, when it's uh, cooled down to 77 Kelvin uh, we see that it has a very large uh, detectivity so it's a very good detector uh, on the other hand uh, we need to cool it down to this temperature so we need a cooling system uh, it will be larger it will be very expensive now if we use uh, the same material but uh, if we cool it down just uh, to 196 Kelvin then uh, we have a similar shape but uh, we have decreased the detectivity by about one order of magnitude so uh, there are thermal cameras that are actually cooled uh, that's an example of uh, those detectors or those detectors you see 77 Kelvin uh, and uh, those cameras uh, will have a very good ability to detect the radiation they will have a very good resolution and uh, very good uh, accuracy but on the other hand uh, they uh, will require this cooling system and they will be very expensive uh, now normal thermal cameras today they do not require this cooling uh, 
at least the ones we will show you in the labs and uh, they are working in normal room temperatures but uh, they will be somewhere around here so uh, with a very smaller sensitivity you see few orders of magnitude smaller sensitivity than the cooled thermal cameras so they will have uh, less accuracy but uh, they do not require this cooling system and uh, they will be about let's say two orders or three orders of magnitude cheaper than the cooled ones now the, the cooled thermal cameras uh, they can cost uh, let's say more than uh, let's say 30,000 euros maybe maybe even more uh, and uh, the normal thermal cameras the price might be something like 1,000 euros so uh, there is a significant difference in price but also in uh, capabilities so uh, the cooled ones are able to uh, have larger resolution and uh, larger accuracy uh, Let's have a word about uh, materials for infrared optics. Now, infrared optics requires uh, completely different materials than visible optics. In visible optics, uh, we use glass, for example, to create the lenses. But in IR optics, we need different materials. And the reason, again, is absorption and properties of the materials for different wavelengths. Now there are two typical materials that are used in IR optics, that's silicon and germanium. You can see here the approximate wavelengths uh, where those materials are being used. So uh, if uh, we are talking about normal IR thermometers that work between 8 and uh, 14 micrometers, then you see that germanium is uh, the good material for that because here it has uh, good properties in this region. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, we uh, want to measure in different wavelengths, uh, such as uh, the short wavelength infrared, then we need shorter wavelengths, so we might be somewhere around here. Uh, you can see sapphire might be a good material, uh, or even sodium chloride. But those materials might have other disadvantages. For example, uh, sodium chloride, it's salt, and uh, those materials uh, for, can, for example, be very sensitive to humidity or to mechanical damage. So, uh, based on, again, the, the bound weight that uh, it's required for your measurement, uh, your thermometer or thermal camera will have different materials for the optics. Uh, here is uh, what we can actually find inside uh, an IR thermal camera or an IR uh, temperature sensor. Now, this sensor is uh, called a microbolometer. Uh, in principle, it is nothing else than a resistive temperature detector. And uh, we are looking for uh, the infrared radiation. Here we have the infrared radiation that's being received and uh, this element here shown in red this red plate is uh, the resistive temperature sensor and uh, when it receives the infrared radiation uh, this will change uh, the temperature of this object and we'll be able to see this as a change of electrical resistance for example uh, now there is a typically a reflected layer after this uh, infrared absorber. Uh, the reason is that we want to make use of uh, the met radiation that uh, is being passed through this object and we want to reflect it back to use more of uh, the available radiation. And uh, note that there is a typically also a gap uh, between uh, the object here, with the red, red plate, and uh, the blue plate. Uh, this is uh, due to, to insulate uh, thermally the two layers. So that it's a layer of air or some insulation material. Now this is a single element. So now this might work as an IR thermometer. Uh, if we want to make it uh, work as an IR camera, then uh, we need uh, multiple elements 
in the matrix and uh, you see that here in this picture on the bottom left so here you see the matrix of the elements that are in the chip now a single element is uh, detailed here in top so this is the single element uh, here we can see the electrodes and those electrodes are connecting uh, that electrically uh, to, the, to the material that is below and uh, here we have uh, the circuit uh, that is used to read out the, the numbers from, uh, from um, the resistance from that, from that uh, surface. So it's arranged in a matrix. Uh, we can see what is approximately the size of the pixels. So here this short line is about 10 micrometers. So the pixel size in this case uh, is something like 40 by 40 micrometers. Uh, so then uh, in this matrix, um, that's how you get the image. And uh, again, it's a question, what resolution do you uh, require for your experiments? Uh, now, typically, uh, the resolution of those thermal cameras is uh, significantly smaller than uh, the resolution of optical cameras. Today, we are used to something like Full HD and, and so on. But uh, in thermal cameras, uh, it's still something like 160, 260 points. For the cheaper ones, it might be something like uh, 800 points times 600 points for the really expensive one that ones that are... Um, expensive and uh, the price might be something like uh, 40 50,000 euros for the camera so now this is the chip itself uh, on the next slide I have a picture of the comp of the whole chip uh, here this chip is obviously uh, arranged inside of the thermal camera and uh, here we can see the optics here we can see the germanium lens uh, and uh, it's focusing the light, uh, not light, but radiation uh, through the chip so that we have a sharp image. And uh, here uh, we might have some additional filters uh, to filter out uh, specific wavelengths. So uh, as an add-on to thermal cameras, you may get uh, filters that are based on uh, those materials that you see here and uh, those materials may filter out the wavelengths that you do not want uh, in the picture so then it's possible to use filters if uh, for example you have a furnace where you're heating glass and uh, in this furnace you want to uh, filter out the flame uh, and uh, you don't want to see the flame but uh, you want to see just the, the object that you are heating so uh, it's possible to filter this out if you know what is uh, the wavelength where the flame has some radiation, for example. Now this is a, an example of uh, such a microbolometer chip. Uh, so from the outside, it looks very similar to a CCD chip uh, from a normal camera, but the, the principle is, com is completely different. Now this works as an array of uh, thermometers and then the, the image is processed and we see the image uh, but uh, the, w the way it's created is different from CCD chips in cameras uh, you can see here that uh, the optics looks also completely different so if you look uh, on the thermal camera now this is the lens that you see so it's either from silicon or germanium typically you cannot see through the lens but uh, you can uh, the, the IR radiation will pass through because uh, it's transparent to those wavelengths. Uh, the, here are a few examples of thermal cameras. Um, you will have a chance to use them in the lab. Now they look um, very similar, all of them. So there is a, some screen and you may focus the image and uh, you may store it and uh, you may combine it uh, with the live camera image and so on and so on. Uh, so that's all about thermal cameras for the moment. And now let's see uh, the thermometers. Now the first uh, example I will show you uh, is called a disappearing filament pyrometer. Now this is an example of a IR thermometer uh, 
that uh, is uh, using our own eyes and uh, it is using our ability to compare the brightness of different objects. Uh, example application might be temperature in a furnace, you're melting glass, you're melting metals and uh, you want to see if uh, the temperature is what it should be. Uh, and the principle is uh, shown on the picture here in the bottom. Now here on the right we have a hot object. Now this is uh, our furnace, this is our molten glass or molten metal. Uh, now uh, we have few lenses uh, that are used to focus uh, the light and get us uh, a clear image. Uh, this is passing through a neutral filter, so uh, this is decreasing the intensity of radiation because uh, we could not look directly into the hot object, so it, it's similar as if you would look directly into the sun. So the neutral filter here is decreasing the, is, uh, de in decreasing the intensity. Now there is a lamp and uh, this lamp has a filament, so this is a bulb and uh, we are looking on uh, the object that we have in the background and we are looking on the filament of the lamp. And there is some additional optics here, lens and eyepiece and here we have a red filter. Now the reason for the red filter is that uh, we are trying to see only the wavelengths that corresponds to red color, uh, which is uh, 650 nanometers. So now this is an example of a monochromatic pyrometer. So we are looking for intensity at a single wavelength. Now the picture of uh, the device, uh, again, you'll have it available in the lab, is shown here on top. So uh, with this part, you look into the furnace and uh, with, this is the eyepiece you look inside. And here you have a scale and uh, you read the temperature of the object on the scale. So now how is this working? Uh, let's look on the, the object. Now what we see is uh, the hot object in the background and uh, we see the filament of the bulb here. This is a called pyrometric bulb and uh, if uh, the radiation from uh, the object filament is larger than the radiation from the object then we see a bright filament on a darker background so this is here this example that's uh, in the middle so in this picture we see a bright filament on the darker background so now in this example uh, we know that the brightness of the filament is larger and uh, we want to decrease it and the way uh, we can decrease the filament intensity is uh, by controlling current. So uh, if you look on this device here, uh, then actually with this ring you may change the current that is flowing through the filament and uh, this will change the intensity of radiation from the lamp. Uh, if uh, on the other hand uh, we see a dark filament here on uh, the bright background. Now this means that uh, we don't have enough current in the filament. So we need to increase the brightness uh, that we have uh, in the filament here by increasing the current. And the final result that we actually want is uh, shown here on the right. In this part we see uh, that uh, the brightness of the background and the brightness of the filament at this point marked by the needle is the same. So in this moment we know that uh, we have the same brightness and uh, according to Planck's law if we have the same brightness on the same band width uh, we will have the same temperature. Now obviously the temperature of uh, the filament here does not need to be the same as the temperature of the hot object uh, because here we have molten metal and here we have a filament. So uh, the neutral filter is decreasing the intensity of the 
radiation. So we are not comparing temperatures, but we are comparing intensities. And uh, if this is calibrated uh, in, te in temperature scale, then we don't need to heat the filament up to the same temperature as the object. So again, you will have a chance to use this or see this at least uh, on, the, on the lab classes. Uh, note that uh, in order to make it work, we are actually using our own eyes uh, to compare the brightness. And uh, therefore, it's uh, not an objective measurement. Uh, it will depend on the observer uh, and uh, on the way he will set the settings on this uh, instrument. Uh, so this instrument is used uh, in furnaces uh, where you want to check the temperature uh, or where you want to, to check uh, the temperature of some hot metal that you have, uh, that you are rolling and so on. Uh, if we want to have uh, a value as a result of uh, our measurement or some useful signal, uh, we can use the total radiation parameter. Now this is the schematic how it works. It's uh, quite similar to the previous example. Here we have an object with temperature T1. We are receiving some radiation. We focus that and uh, here we have in the focal point we have a temperature sensor. Now, now in this case uh, this is typically a thermocouple uh, or it might be a thermistor for example and uh, we measure the temperature of this uh, temperature sensor. Now if the temperature of uh, the object will be larger, uh, it will produce more radiation and here this will correspond to a larger temperature on uh, the temperature sensor. So now this meter here in the schematic uh, that might be calibrated directly in as temperature uh, and it can measure for example the vol voltage from a thermocouple or it might measure uh, the uh, resistance if it's a resistive temperature detector. Now again, the gray filters are used to decrease the intensity of the radiation and uh, uh, to work with small temperatures. And eventually, on the right-hand side, you may have may have a window with the lens or with uh, where you can look and uh, you can check if you're pointing the thermometer correctly. Uh, here are a few examples. Uh, here on uh, the top uh, right uh, we have an industrial example of such IR thermometer. Uh, the same here on the bottom. And here there is an example of um, application. So here we can see the pyrometer on the right hand side. And in this e example they have used it to measure the temperature during a small explosion of a pyrotechnic charge. So uh, there are many examples where those uh, radiation pyrometers can be used. Uh, some more examples from uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, if you have um, to measure the temperature of a molten glass uh, or uh, metals uh, during rolling, for example, then uh, you can use those IR thermometers uh, you need to select the correct range of temperatures and also for different materials you might use different wavelengths and, and filters eventually uh, because some materials like glass might be transparent or might not be transparent for uh, different wavelengths that uh, you uh, need for the measurements. So this is typically used in those applications that you see in those pictures. Uh, I recommend you to take a look on uh, those videos. Uh, by the way, the presentation is uh, in Moodle, so you can uh, you can use it and uh, check the links here. Uh, it shows more examples of uh, IR measurements. Uh, let's spend a few more minutes on uh, IR thermometers. Uh, this is how it works. So I already explained this here. This detector might be the bolometer or it might be the thermocouple. Uh, but when you are doing measurements with IR thermometers and IR thermocameras, it's uh, very important to use them correctly. Uh, now, uh, a very important uh, thing for IR thermometers is that uh, 
they do not measure at a single point. Uh, we you could uh, you could uh, point that and at one object, and uh, here the field of view uh, needs to be larger, uh, uh, sorry, smaller than the object itself. So, if uh, your object is here, that's uh, this size, and the field of view is larger you are actually uh, receiving the radiation from the object plus the radiation from the background. So it will calculate a kind of average temperature. Uh, it needs to be done in this way. Here, this is my field of view, which is smaller than the object. So this object is larger. And I'm receiving uh, the uh, whole radiation from the object. Um, here in this picture, uh, sorry for the check, I forgot to translate that. Uh, this is uh, showing you a very similar thing. This is the sensor, and uh, this is the object, and uh, this is the circle, that's the field of view. So uh, this is very good. Here in this case, uh, we have a field of view significantly smaller than the object itself. So we receive the radiation only from the object. Now this may still work, uh, the case in the middle. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a similar size for the object and uh, for the field of view. So this may work as well uh, when the uh, temperature is not much different at the edges of the object. So here, at those edges here, uh, if you have a different temperature, uh, this might be a problem. And uh, here, this case is wrong. Uh, in this case, the field of view is uh, larger than the object itself. So that's uh, what we see here. Uh, we receive radiation from the object plus radiation from the background. Now on here in, on the right, we have an example uh, of uh, the data sheet of such a temperature sensor, the IR thermometer. And uh, typically, the size for the field of view is uh, given as a ratio. So you have distance and you have uh, the diameter of the field of view. And uh, typically, it's something like 6 to 1, 5 to 1. So for example, if uh, here this distance is, let's say, 5 meters, then this might be something like uh, 1 meter, approximately, if the ratio would be 5 to 1, for example. Uh, here in this table, you can see approximately uh, the accuracy and range that we can achieve. So uh, even though uh, many IR thermometers are stating that they have a resolution of uh, something like 0 0.1, well in this case it's Fahrenheit, but in centigrade it's uh, about the same, uh, then the accuracy typically is something like plus minus 1 or plus minus 2 centigrades. So uh, the accuracy is not as good as uh, we have, for example, in uh, contact sensors such as R RTDs. Uh, so remember, uh, it's important to correctly use the thermometer or the thermal camera. It's important to uh, watch out for the reflections from the objects that are around you. So this is the sun, for example, this is uh, the ambient radiation, and this is the uh, reflected radiation. Uh, you also need to watch uh, for objects that are behind your object, if your object is transparent, so this may heat it up. And uh, you may have a problem with uh, reflective objects. Uh, there is a picture here on the right, uh, that's me in a mirror with a thermal camera. So obviously I do not measure the temperature of the mirror, but I measure the reflections. So that's here, that's my shape with my reflection in the mirror. And uh, if I don't know the emissivity of uh, the surface of the mirror, uh, I cannot uh, measure the temperature properly. And a similar example is uh, shown here in the left. And uh, here uh, there are different materials. Um, 
here there is wood in this area, here in this area there is metal, and uh, all the temp objects had the same temperature, but uh, they have different emissivities. So uh, it appears uh, as they have uh, different uh, temperatures, but in fact the temperature is the same. Uh, at the end, uh, let me show you some examples where we can use IR cameras. For example, we can uh, see sediments in tanks. So now this is a, such an example, a tank that is heated to larger temperatures than, amb than ambient. And here in the bottom we can see some sediments, uh, here it's blocking the radiation and uh, it appears to be colder. Uh, another example in engineering, uh, we might detect uh, bearing problems. Uh, here that's, this is an example of an induction motor. Here in the bearing area we have a larger temperature and uh, we might detect some problems uh, with bearings. In all those examples, uh, unless uh, we know the emissivity of the surface, uh, we actually cannot tell what is the temperature, but uh, we might see that there is a difference. Uh, a thermal camera is uh, used in the ideal case where uh, you have uh, an emissivity of uh, the whole area constant. So in the ideal case, all this picture would have and constant emissivity and then we can say okay now this area is hotter than this area over here and if we know what the emissivity is uh, we can actually tell what the temperature is. Uh, more examples we can of course detect some heat leakage so uh, here there is a heat leakage under insulation so here it has a large temperature Again, know that this pipe uh, has a, the same surface, so we assume that it has the same emissivity, and therefore we can really tell uh, what is the, that here we have a hot spot. Uh, another example, uh, we use it a lot uh, in electronics. Uh, if you are inspecting uh, printed circuit boards and uh, trying to detect faulty components, then you may see something like this, a chip here with a larger temperature, uh, this is the PCB itself and uh, in this case uh, probably this chip uh, is wrong or has some, some short connection and uh, it might need replacement. So this is an example. Again, uh, without knowing what the emissivity actually is, uh, there is no info about the actual temperature. So this, this temperature scale might be completely wrong. Uh, last example. Uh, IR measurement uh, is uh, used, uh, for example, uh, to measure temperature of uh, brakes in uh, Formula cars. Uh, here, here you can see such an example from University of, er of Erlangen in Germany. And uh, they have used the IR sensor to measure the temperature during, uh, during the, the race. You can see here the data. Unfortunately, it's not very visible, but uh, uh, at least uh, we can see the curve here uh, that was uh, the thermocouple and uh, then they have compared this measurement uh, with uh, the IR thermometer. And uh, here on the bottom uh, you can see a similar uh, application that was one of my students a few years ago. Uh, he used that to measure uh, the temperature of a disc during uh, a race, uh, it was a truck race. And again, uh, we have obtained such a record uh, with a the thermocouple and uh, with the IR uh, sensor. Uh, here the problem was that uh, the disc uh, at some moments of the, of, of the race uh, was cooled with water and uh, there was a lot of water vapor and uh, this has completely blocked the IR radiation. So uh, you may have problems with absorption in the atmosphere even for very small distances. Now in this case it was something like two centimeters but uh, even in this small distance uh, when there was a uh, water vapor uh, it uh, caused trouble during the measurements. Uh, at the end I recommend you to, to take a look on those videos.
Uh, one of them is uh, from the glass industry where you can see how they measure the temperature of uh, glass during production and the other other is also from uh, from glass production again explanation where uh, you can use the uh, tem the temperature sensors